Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silence so that they don't uh, disrupt the broadcasting or the meeting. Um, we have no apologies today, however, Mary Fee has to attend other committee business and we'll be leaving at some point during the course of the morning. Um, today's agenda is um, our inquiry into young people's pathways. This is the fourth evidence session from the inquiry into young people's pathways. So far, the committee has undertaken a survey and workshop with young people, taken evidence from a number of bodies and the chair of the Commission on Developing Scotland's Young work Workforce and visited Shetland as part of the inquiry. And this morning, we would like to welcome to committee James Russell, Director of Career Information Advice and Guidance, and Sharon Kelly, Head of Operations from Skills Development Scotland, and also Alan Armstrong, Strategic Director, and Joan Mackay, Assistant Director from Education Scotland. Okay, I ask members to indicate if they would like to come in on any of the questions, but um, uh, I would like to open today's proceeding with just asking for a, a brief um, key points in the area that you would like to, to mention to the committee. And if I go to Mr Russell first. Thanks. Good morning. Um, Skills Development Scotland um, are uh, pleased to provide an update to the progress that we're making as part of the partnership work um, into young people's pathways and improving outcomes for young people. Um, we have quite a significant contribution to the senior phase vocational pathways, recommendation one, through the development and delivery of foundation apprenticeships and through uh, the delivery and recommendation two of the career information advice and guidance services. Um, we have extensive partnership working with our colleagues here from Education Scotland and through the network in delivering um, our expectations against each of those recommendations. Thank you. Uh, Mr Armstrong? Thank you, yes. We welcome the opportunity to already update the committee on the progress we're making in taking forward the Developing Young, young Workforce recommendations on the career education standard uh, and our contribution to the senior phase pathways work. Uh, we lead on, on several aspects of the schools-based recommendations, and we work very closely with a broad range of partners um, to support the wider aspects of, of the complete programme. Um, Education Scotland were asked to work with SDS, uh, local authorities and employer representatives to develop the career education standard. And that standard was published back in 2015 and we continue to work uh, very closely in partnership with a whole range of people um, and now the DYW new employer groups to support schools and their partners to implement the entitlements for young people that are within the, the standard. And children and young people were directly involved in helping us to um, develop the process in, back in 2015 and their input shaped the standard at that time but it continues to shape the ways that we go about um, making sure it's available in schools. And the standard recognises the journey that young people are on as they learn about the world of work right from the early years right the way through to the senior phase and it sets out what children will learn but also crucially what relevant adults in their lives um, will what, what they can do and what they will do to support them in that learning. And really, the aim is to make sure that young people are better informed about their abilities, because we know that young people live in this complex and changing in environment, and that the old linear pathways um, through school can no longer serve their needs. So the, the standard, and DYW in general actually, um, is in the way it's being implemented, we're seeing the complexity playing out at school level. Uh, as changes are made in the curriculum. And that really means the offer that a school makes to its own young people. And we see that commitment and appetite from the staff in these schools and their partners to expand the offer. And this is leading to the emergence of, of some innovative practice, I'm sure, that we can touch on. Um, we also rec um, welcomed SCEL, the Scottish College for Educational Leadership, into Education Scotland earlier this year. And we immediately started to work with them actively to embed the Developing Young Workforce agenda into their complete suite of leadership programmes. Uh, it was there before in the Excellence and Headship, but now we're working to make sure they go right across. One final point, I think, on um, inspection and review. The evidence we've gathered from across inspection and review shows we're making really steady progress um, with the Career Education Standard and with DYW. And some schools are moving more quickly now, and others are picking up pace. 
But what we're seeing is that all are progressing. Uh, and most secondary schools are developing these learner pathways more flexibly, increasing the partnership working. And that means consortia arrangements often between schools. It means bringing local businesses in, working with local businesses and community partners, providing that wide range of options. So, I mean, in summary, I think we really welcome the opportunity to explore that with you this morning um, and to highlight some of the creative practices that we've seen. Thank you very much. Um, we have um, some broad topical areas to cover today. Um, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing we'll stick to those, but we're going to start with vocational pathways. And I'd like to invite Rona Mackay to ask a question. Thank you, Cindy. Good morning, panel. Um, yes, can I start, please, by asking you what progress has been made towards measuring and publishing information on vocational pathways um, alongside the other school performance indicators? I don't know who would like to start? Yes. We're have to kick up on that. Um, it's quite a mixed picture at the moment. We're working with data from a range of sources. So, for instance, we look at um, the data that SFC has to tell us uh, the trajectory and how um, how that you know how the pickup of vocational pathways is going. Um, we haven't got all of that in one place yet, so that's very much a work in progress. Something that we know we need to bring together. We're doing a piece of work on that, um, testing that out at school level at the moment, and over the course of this year, we'll be doing that. So we'll be able to come back with. Um, some more information on that. Can you give us an idea of time scale of, you say you haven't got it complete, what, what sort of, have you do have a target? Well, I, I think we're timing it with the, the, the life of the programme. We had to allow us get to a point where we were seeing some significant progress at school level. We're now beginning to see that and through inspection, for instance, we are picking up now um, the story and the narrative of the change. What we're not there yet is having the collation of data in the one place that it's easy to make sense of it. So in terms of time scale, I'm guessing it's going to take us this latter part of the programme to get to that stage. Mm -hmm. okay. And as I say, we've just started some of that work, exploring that work with all our partners just now. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Armstrong, you talked about the pace of change in, in, in rolling out uh, vocational pathways. Again, can you, can you perhaps maybe quantify that a wee bit for us and let us know how that's picking up and, and you know how it's it's progressing. I think I'm very comfortable with the progress that we're making. This is a, a significant change. The senior phase, the, as it's con as, as conceptualised at the moment, is radically different to what was in, in place before, um, and that means that schools have had to take quite a significant time to look very closely at what they were doing, how they were doing it, looking at the young people in their school, and co-designing what the offer should be. And for that, that also means that they then to quite often find partners, link up with businesses, think of new and wider ranges of courses to offer. Um, and what we're seeing now is the, the senior phase becoming much less of a, of a linear pathway, kind of linear progression, which would have been the case before Curriculum for Excellence, where young people tended to move through standard grade, foundation general and credit, then higher, then advanced higher, and then on, with young people then dropping off, so that after S4, 20% stopped coming to school, they went somewhere. Um, with that, that has been changed now from that linear to much more of what you might call um, a web or a matrix of an offer across S4, S5 and S6. And in the best cases, we are seeing S4 and S5 and S6 coming together um, by the school. And it, organising young people in that way to open up the opportunities for S4, S5 and S6 to choose from a larger menu of, uh, of courses and, and options. Um, now, we're seeing that in a large number of schools. What we're also then seeing is other schools picking up on this. Now, we're doing a lot of activity in that area in terms of collecting and sharing ideas, working with networks, um, and then helping through social media, through our web, share some examples that, that are coming through. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing activity from the, the people who are for, more forward thinking, who have got a bit of traction in this, helping some of the others. Uh, it's an uneven playing field just now, and that's exactly as we would expect in such a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. And, and do you see that moving on quite rapidly? You know, to... the, as I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, the, the inspection um, gives me great heart, the last set of inspection advice from over last session, gives me great heart in some of the examples, some of which I think were in our, our, our submission, um, of the commitment to schools to be looking at this, um, not just as a function, but as a genuine hearts and mind reality that this is about the young people in their school at that time. And 
again, that's a slightly different approach where schools are now realising that your S456 cohort changes every year because your new S4 comes in, your S6 goes out and different people leave. Therefore, you have to look at it again and, and what you're offering. Mm -hmm. So your course choices are not static okay. um, and will continue to grow. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr Russell. And uh, I guess just to reiterate that from a foundation apprenticeship point of view, it's important to note that the first two years of the foundation apprenticeship programme was about building capacity in the system. So it was a pathfinder um, programme at that time um, to support uh, the challenges uh, and differences, I guess, around curriculum planning, partnership working, bringing all those players together um, in, a, in a local area to ensure the success of that programme. So this is the first year that we're starting to see the positive outcomes from um, the 2016 cohort, which was cohort one, um, as that's progressing. And again, to reiterate the point that Alan's made about um, the learning from that. So we published a report recently around the progress in learning from foundation apprenticeships, which enables us to start building on what's working um, and sharing that with more partners um, as we move through the expansion of that programme towards 2019. Can I maybe ask a wee bit about um, targets and, and, and why different targets have been reported uh, on, for foundation apprenticeships in recent years? And do you think too much attention has been, pay, has been given to foundation apprenticeships at the expense of other vocational pathways? Or do you think the balance is correct? But it's mainly just the, the disparity in the, the different targets I'm interested in. Yeah, I, I think the balance is correct. Um, it's got to be right for the circumstances that the schools operate within and, and the network that they have round about them and the delivery partnerships that they have in order to successfully do that. And we're continuing to expand the opportunities for lead partners that previously it was colleges which led to that partnership. Local authorities are now doing that, um, and the commissioning for next year is also opened up to independent training providers. So, I think the focus um, is right. Um, it's a, a, a significant change program in the curriculum. Um, it requires uh, all of those individuals and parties to be able to come together and um, be able to deliver those. Um, and uh, that's a change for employers. It's a change for colleges and schools also. Mm -hmm. Um, and to the foundation apprenticeship target, um, I believe there has been um, references made to differing targets. Um, I just have to make it very clear that um, through our relationship with the Scottish Government, um, SDS has always been and continues to be focused on um, the availability of 5,000 opportunities for foundation apprenticeships in Scotland to 2019, and that hasn't changed for us at all. Um, how, how is that target reached? Um, so part of the development of uh, the Foundation Apprenticeship Programme has been uh, it's industry led um, and as DYW recommended it compares us to the top performing OECD countries um, and we look at countries like Germany and Switzerland where we've taken a lot of the great practice in the development of the Foundation Apprenticeship Frameworks working with SQA Education Scotland. It, it was understanding what capacity we had within the curriculum in order to be able to deliver that. So um, how do you, the challenge is always how do you implement a, a change programme providing those opportunities to many people as possible without being unrealistic about what you're doing. I mean, you consider that um, if you, S5 is the starting point for foundation apprenticeships um, and the 5,000 by 2019 gives us around about 12 to 15% of the S5 cohort having the opportunity to be able to do that alongside other formal senior phase vocational pathways um, and vocational learning programmes. Okay, thanks. And just one final question on this. Um, can you tell us what steps are being taken to ensure that vocational pathways are as valued um, or are of equivalent value to academic pathways? How are you managing to bridge that gap? Absolutely. Um, so certainly from um, SDS um, and the work that we do um, at every level um, in our engagement with our partners and um, our customers and stakeholders, um, we um, are very aware that we have to, we, we believe in parity of steam for both academic and vocational um, programmes. Um, and the challenge for us is that because we commission those apprenticeship programmes, it looks like we have a specific focus around apprenticeships rather than vocational, and that's absolutely not the case. Um, so what we see is work-based learning programmes has been an enriched learning route um, that uh, adapts to different learning styles for young people. 
Um, so uh, absolutely, we are promoting equal opportunities. So from careers advisors in schools, um, undertaking group work through our universal services and supporting young people, um, they are responsible for providing the information and advice about all of the routes and pathways that exist for young people. And there's a parity of esteem in all of them. And we work, you know, this is all about choice for young people. And in order to make an informed choice, and that's the focus of our service, uh, absolutely, from a CIAG point of view. Um, that you have to know and understand what all those opportunities look like. So we have quite a structured programme of interventions across each of the year groups on a face-to-face -face basis with young people, which explores those routes and pathways and the opportunities that exist either in the local economy or, or in Scotland generally through the regional skills assessments and the skills demand statements that we have. Mm -hmm. And then through our work with teachers, through Education Scotland, we've developed um, quite a lot of capacity building activities. Um, career-long professional learning um, resources for teachers which focus around labour market information, so introducing what that looks and feels like, what it means for you when you're teaching um, uh, in your classrooms, there's curriculum inserts there, um, and the work that we do with parents with schools, so um, certainly in schools we're involved with those schools in planning what the parental engagement looks like. Um, and we deliver interventions with parents across all of the year groups, as well as having that opportunity of one-to-one -one support with them during those significant subject choice times. So it's about ensuring that everybody that's involved in influencing and informing um, young people's choices and decisions, because we only play one part of that, um, that we furnish them with the information and advice that they need in order to help have that career conversation, as we would reference it. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to bring in uh, Ms Lamont. Okay. I just really to, to pursue a couple of points that have been raised there. First of all, uh, Mr Armstrong, you said that young people have a larger menu from which to choose. But the evidence we received last week from Professor Scott was that, the, in fact, there is a restriction in subject choice and the number of subjects a young person can choose. So how does that square with the idea that you've got a larger menu when the evidence from last week was that it was narrowing and constricting? Yes, the, there's, there's always a limit to the number of um, courses any young person can follow because of the, the hours in the school day. And the, but um, my reference there was to the range of options that a young person has. So that's moving away from what you might call traditional subjects um, in towards more schools for work um, courses, uh, more national certificates um, and more national progression awards, opening up that menu of options in there. And what we're seeing is that um, menu being available to young people and the distinct motivation young people are finding from studying foundation apprenticeships um, or working with employers in um, over the S4 or S5 or S6. Um, so schools are very creative in the ways that they arrange their, their option choices for young people. And sometimes if a school has, let's say, six or seven um, options for young people, uh, within that, for some young people, uh, one option could actually mean two short courses in, in schools for work or something in there. So there's a, so, there's a rich a way that young people can... So the larger provide. menu is you're getting a series of wee topics within a year rather than one substantial if, subject, if which is not that, quite the same thing. I wonder if you've looked at Professor Scott's um, research and, and will yes. maybe perhaps it would be worthwhile maybe asking you to reflect on that further than maybe coming back to the committee and that was a very substantial issue there, which would be yeah. direct contradiction to what you're saying, Happy to frankly, do that. in terms of access. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about the, the issue of face-to-face -face support? Can you define what face-to-face -face means? Yes, so uh, we have two approaches, um, and I'll maybe bring Sharon Kelly in on this, um, uh, through our universal service delivery, um, which is face-to-face -face in a group setting and also um, in a one-to-one -one basis. The size of the group? Uh, so in classroom sizes, so around about 30 So you define your face-to-face as maybe 30 young people in front of you? Well, it, it is a face-to-face -face service, so it's combined um, with the one-to-one -one support. So we have, from Primary 7 S1 all the way through to S6, defined engagements with young people on a face-to-face -face basis, either through group um, or through one-to-one -one, um, support. So what proportion of young people could accept, expect to have advice in smaller than a group, a group face-to-face, -face, which is really just a classroom setting, what proportion of them would have access to one-to-one -to -one advice? Um, so in the broad general education phase, we have 100% um, entitlement for young people, really. All young people are entitled to the group sessions in S1, 2 and 3, um, but also the one-to-one face-to-face support that they receive at their subject choice. So, so, that's so every young person gets to speak to somebody with a subject choice? Yes. That's it? But the rest is really just, as most people would just say, that's a classroom setting. Another thing I wanted just to ask 
Um, you talked about, I think both Mr Armstrong and yourself talked about the networks that were offered to schools. How do you stop that reinforcing inequality? Because some schools will have access to loads of businesses, people who perhaps within the parents' groups have businesses of their own, have access to those opportunities. Other schools might find that more difficult because of the pressures are under. It seems very unfair if we, through the system, we've got of, of an opportunity of reinforcing that inequality and that ability to bring somebody in. Is there, not some, is there something to be argued that these resources should be made available to all schools rather than the young people being at the mercy of what would be very local networks? Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you mean by local networks. Um, well, so, what was said was that schools are encouraged to develop their own networks, bring yes. businesses in, offer young people opportunities. That is going to be easier in an urban setting, in a more prosperous area, with perhaps parents have access to all sorts of contacts and so on, than perhaps in a rural area or in an area where there are fewer businesses functioning. And therefore, the, the, mm -hmm. the school's opportunities to develop a network are going to be very different depending on where that school is. How do you stop that reinforcing of the disadvantages already in the school system? Well, I, I can begin that. We're acutely aware of the rural, for instance, and remote issues. Um, and what we are seeing, actually, is a huge amount of creativity around what people are being able to do. So. When we began the work on developing the young workforce, we didn't go to the urban schools and we didn't go to these obvious settings where networks might be easily accessible, more easily accessible. For instance, we went to Dumfries and Galloway, first of all. We went to Argyll and Butte. And we worked out on the ground with them what would work in these settings. And that's continued to influence the work we're still doing today in partnership with SDS in terms of any of the offers we're putting together. But Important to know that you know some of the thinking, for instance, had gone on in Dumfries and Galloway around um, what they called at the end, that point the bridge project, and we have followed that through because that began to influence the thinking um, on, about how we helped and supported schools. But but the evidence on the ground is that the schools, in, in particular schools where there are real challenges, they are the ones often who are the most innovative and creative and have come up with the solutions. So that's what we're tracking. Um, We've also seen the model in the Western Isles as an island um, authority who got going on a lot of this very early on, 2008, 2009, and have tracked that model. And we see other authorities um, learning from the Western Isles, from Dumfries and Galloway. Um, I, could, I have several other examples. I'm not sure if you want to as, come back and some yeah, of that. Yes. I, mean, I accept that that's been done. My argument more is that if you're saying it's about the school and its networks, even within urban areas, the capacity and access to contacts, the people who are, willing, who are friends of the school, are going to be different in different areas. So how do you yeah. mitigate that? But we, we now have in play um, the DYW employer groups. That took a bit of a while to set up that part of the structure. And uh, they are now all operational, fully operational. And we are beginning to see the impact of these groups in terms of making the links with schools, in terms of support for businesses. Um, and sometimes, actually, in rural and remote communities, there is more strength in there because of the knowledge, the local knowledge of, for instance, small and medium enterprise businesses or, or one-off businesses where there's a far more of an interest on an individual level. So it's, it's quite a mixed picture. I, I think we have moved away from an assumption that um, urban settings will have the best access to the opportunities. And I actually think it's within urban settings and rural and, urban yes, and, and yeah. fragile remote areas are going to be quite different as well. I mean, I hear what yes, you're saying that, yes, but yeah. the idea that a school has to make contacts and those contacts come in and they create a network is going to create problems in a school where there are perhaps fewer families with um, access. I mean, it's like it's everything else in education. If you're looking for um, work experience, if you're sitting in a school with lots of people who run their own businesses or whatever, yeah. parents, you have to create opportunities that other schools don't have. And I just wondered, it's really how you mitigate the inequality there okay. rather than reinforcing it. Yes, yeah. I can give some examples of that. If we think about the STEM agenda, science, technology, engineering and, and maths, again, we're, we're very focused on making sure that um, there may not be uh, the the most relevant employers, I think, at the point you're making in that local area. So the, the one or two things there, we, we have a, a, a network of development officers who's uh, for science now, in the, whose role is to connect across primary schools through the RAISE programme um, funded by Sadie and Wood. 
uh, and that's a pilot at the moment. <clears throat> and these development officers are looking for ways to connect in a much in a regional level rather than school by school, a regional level to make sure that children in primary school have access to um, industry connections, either by visits or to the school or, or, or going out on visits, and that teachers have professional learning. We also have um, some uh, work going on with the uh, science centres, who uh, were helping them with their outreach work to make sure that they can address um, uh, some of the gaps in terms of understanding of parents around about the STEM agenda, and parents and family, and family learning. And that goes well beyond the local area of a, of a city, but actually takes much more of, of, a, of a regional approach. And finally, um, we also, through, um, through the GLOW um, infrastructure in schools, uh, we provide access to uh, employers, to industry employers, to people who work in the digital sector, for example, people who work in cyber security. They can have what we call glow meets, which are live with a classroom in there. So that's to try and help that geographical sparsity that you may find in there. And that helps the school to take something from the kind of national offer or regional offer, or indeed from their own local employers. I have a number of members that want to come in with um, supplementary as well. I'll take Ms V first. Thank you, Convener. It was just a, a brief follow-up question on foundation apprenticeships. I wonder, Mr Russell, if you could give us the up-to-date figure of how many foundation apprenticeships are currently in place and whether you believe you're on target, uh, you're on target to meet the, the, the target of 5,000? So, um, the, the figure for uh, the last academic year, we set out to have 2,600 opportunities um, for that, um, and we are currently recruiting for that, so we don't have that starter figure, So because it starts at the start of the academic year. Um, but that is certainly something that we'll be publishing as part of a report um, in November um, to ensure that the recruitment for that programme has taken place. So you don't know how many there are currently, no? How many uh, were there last year? Uh, 1,345 it was. So you wanted to recruit another 1,300? So we went from 345 um, to 1,245 the year after. Um, mm -hmm. 2,600 is planned for this uh, academic year and then 5,000 for next year for the opportunity. 5,000 for next year? An additional 5,000 or up to no, 5,000? No, it will be 5,000 starts for next year. 5,000 starts for next year. Yes. And so the opportunities will be available. 5,000 opportunities will be available. And you believe that's achievable? Well, I think what we've got to do is look at, um, and I guess it picks up on some of this point as well, about schools not having to be responsible to find those, those networks themselves. So a lot of the investment at the start of the Foundation Apprenticeship Pathfinder programmes and currently um, is developing hub delivery models um, so that it brings employers. So we use our networks through SDS um, and through our partners, industry leadership groups, the Scottish Apprenticeship Advisory Board, to influence employers to become part of those delivery hubs so that it is not schools that are consistently trying to find those um, opportunities and, and relationships. Um, so those delivery hubs um, bring all of the partners involved in the delivery of that together. It's about shared learning. We have community practice to embed that. And we considered that the growth from year one or cohort one, the 345 to the 1,200. Um, has been uh, over 200% increase. We've then seen 100% increase as we move to this year. And for us to move from the recruitment this year to the 5,000 opportunities, it reduces that to around about 90%. And I guess through this change programme, um, you know, everybody would be familiar, I would assume, for, with exponential curves and change programmes. So you get the foundations in place, you build the networks, the partnerships, you understand what works and what doesn't. Um, and then that gives you an opportunity actually to scale um, at a pace that's different from trying to build the foundations in at that point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you Mr Mandel. Thank you, Convener. Um, I was just quite astonished actually to hear Education Scotland hold the bridge project up um, as an example of how to tackle uh, rural inequality. Uh, because it, I mean, I, I hear several teachers for just, just as a starting point and lots of people within education in Dumfries and Galway question what the project's about. They feel it replicates the work already being done uh, by the regional college. Uh, and it doesn't get over the fundamental issue, which is how uh, pupils at, at outlying secondary schools in Sankar, in Langham, get over the fact that it's an 80 minute round trip uh, to go to another building uh, in what is a large urban uh, centre within a, a rural region. It doesn't tackle uh, the, the actual point, and I wonder you know, what is being done to make sure 
that the same educational opportunities are available to young people across Scotland, regardless of where they live. Can I come back on the, uh, uh, the bridge project? What was useful uh, when we visited Dumfries and Galway was the thinking, and the thinking was about all of these challenges. Um, and they had begun work. Just creating so another physical space in an urban centre, get over those challenges. I'm not endorsing the creation of a physical space. That's not my point. My point was that a huge amount, they were exactly dealing with the, the issue and the question that you're asking. Uh, so that was very helpful to us in terms of the um, advice we had to, for instance, include in the career education standard, the work placement standard, and the challenges that we're talking about here. So, so that's why but, I, I but you brought up the bridge yes. to, to one of my colleagues as an example of how we deliver services in a rural area. But effectively, the bridge is you know, another campus within an urban yep. setting that is inaccessible to many people uh, in a largely rural region. I, I, I don't personally find that a, a credible solution to these challenges. OK. And I just go back to say to you, we went to explore the thinking around about that. Um, as we did in the Western Isles, what thinking had led to that? Um, so I'm not going to comment on, I mean, if, um, on how the bridge is viewed um, uh, locally. So, well, I, I think that then comes back to some of the evidence that's come in ahead of this session. For example, where Connect say, well, uh, developing the young workforce is embraced by many as a concept. The reality is somewhat different from the vision. Do you not accept that that's but bringing up you know, a, a project that is effectively just another uh, urban-focused solution for a rural area you know, is just another example of that, where you know, we talk about having parity across the country, but when it comes to putting solutions in place, we go back to the same ideas that we already have in place that don't actually address the fundamental challenges. Well, I think we're seeing more than that idea, and I think that's what's emerging across the country, and we don't in any way deny that there are um, challenges with rural communities. What we are seeing is um, an increased and innovative use of digital. Um, we were involved in that when we were um, working with young folk, for instance, in Argyll and Butte, who had come from vast distances just to participate in um, the workshop sessions that we did. We talked in these sessions to their parents, we talked to the teachers involved, and importantly, of course, the young folk and what did work for them. So. Part of our work as we go on is working with SDS is to support the creation of um, offers that make the world of work accessible and understanding about that, for instance, to young people um, more available um, on an online way as well as locally. Um, so that work's ongoing. Uh, the other, I, I think I come back to reiterating what I said about um, we're seeing at local level, schools, yes, have challenges, but they are coming up with um, solutions that are creative and responsive to where they are. I wouldn't deny that schools are coming up with solutions. You know, they, they're, they're being forced to do that. But again, I'm concerned to hear that somehow digital is the answer for people who live remotely. You know, but we're seeing a huge focus, for example, on the bridge. You know, in an area that's already you know got a disproportionate offering on that menu. Uh, compared to outlying areas, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. I, I think your point's been well made, Mr. Vandell. I'm sure I've got an opportunity to come back in later on. Uh, can I bring Mr. Scott in, please? Uh, thank you. And my apologies for being late, uh, Convener. I've yet to find a way to say um, stop speaking to me on the phone to a Shetland constituent at uh, five to ten on a on a Wednesday morning. Um, uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, Joan Mackay about um, work experience because the pretty strong message that many of us got when the committee visited the Anson High School in Lerwick was uh, uh, both secondary three, uh, secondary two, uh, the, the, in other words, the early stages of, of secondary school pupils saying we would like more work experience um, options so as to make best judgment about the courses we take given the narrowing of the choices that are available in the senior phase. How does Education Scotland view that one and have you got some, how do you help, I suppose, schools in widening out that the choice given the, the challenges of finding both employers and also space in the school day to allow children to undertake more work experience options. Yeah, and, and that was an issue that young people raised with us in, in, in all the preparation for the development of the career education standard and then the, we did the work placement standard at the exact mm -hmm. same time because obviously there was a correlation, a heavy correlation between these. Now, um, the work placement standard uh, effectively is for youngsters in the senior phase with options earlier than that. 
So I'll come back to that. But the important thing about the career education standard was recognising that ask from young people um, that they understand more about the world of work. And of course, that was one of the main, the you know, main themes in the City and Woods Commission. So that was an interesting thing to tackle. How do you get young people to have an awareness? And I, I'll give you an example of, of um, a young person, um, and, and it comes back to the digital offer scene. We've just been studying such and such a thing in, in geography. We've done X amount of hours on it. We, um, we know we're doing that in order to pass an exam. Um, we want to know, and they were standing holding their smartphones, we want to know where that has any meaning out there. And that was an, a view echoed um, by children all across secondary, and we also saw some of that in, in primary with the youngsters. And so the, the whole point about the career education standard was that it built into their everyday experiences, the connections, so helping teachers to make the subjects they're teaching today um, more relevant to the world of work so that children were getting the connections. Um, you heard James Russell talk about um, lesson inserts. So, for instance, teachers, a chemistry teacher, a geography teacher today, should be able to find something delivered by a colleague so that that gives a five, ten minute insert to add into a lesson um, today, for instance, which gives them access to somebody talking about the subject, whether it's geography, whether it's somebody working in weather. So they get that five minute insert and the discussions. But the important thing was to develop, and I am coming back to digital, what youngsters do find out a lot of their information from, how could they access that? So my world of work continues to evolve in response to that. But also, really importantly, um, the Career Education Standards asks that very real connections be made with actual employers' work, the industry and the local area, and that is what we are seeing. We are seeing really interesting um, development in early years. We're seeing it in primary, where youngsters are directly involved with employers, either employers coming in or they themselves visiting workplace places. And what we should see is, and that is what we are beginning to see, if you take the bits and pieces that have emerged, is a progression in children's experience and exposure and understanding of the world of work. Isn't it? I mean, well, the, yes, at the moment, I mean, yes. The, this was yes. specifically about work experience choices for yes. kids, particularly yeah. in S1 to S3, so they had more things to relate to that would to help them take choices at, at the senior phase. And the, I think the pattern we've seen across Scotland is it, and understandably so, it's yeah. pretty patchy. But Ian Wood's very strong on this. We need more kids doing more work experience earlier on. I mean, do you, you presumably right. agree with that principle? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, yeah. and that is very much what we're supporting schools to do. You know, So, for instance, in S1 to S3, um, we have the real opportunity just now with the STEM strategy, yeah. which, you know, there's a fundamental thing that if the, if the physics teacher and the biology teacher and the maths teacher aren't working together and offering youngsters opportunities in S1 to S3, then, you know, there's something we need to do there to, for their, them to understand that interplay. And what we are seeing is um, the schools who have gone ahead in all of this, we are seeing, you know, for instance, um, in a unit in chemistry, um, somebody from the local distillery coming in, my memory of chemistry is pretty weak just now, but coming in to teach part of that yeah. unit alongside the teacher so that youngsters are getting that kind of exposure. Um, so that is all there yeah. going on yeah. um, okay. in the mix. Thank you. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm moving on to theme two, um, which is careers information, guidance and advice. I'd like to invite Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, Mr Armstrong, can I just refer you to the submission that you made to the committee where you point to the enhanced uh, career information and uh, advice guidance, etc., which you say has been in place in secondary schools since 2016-17, uh, and that includes the earlier intervention for young people at Primary 7 S1 and in the transition uh, stages in S2 S3. Could you provide us with some evidence to support this? Because um, the other thing that Professor Scott told us at last week's committee in his troll of every single secondary school across the country was that there were very few schools who were providing uh, a very comprehensive and good quality uh, set of guidance for subject choice. And th these two things I don't think quite fit together. So could you give us your uptake on this. I think as um, Joan mentioned there, just where we are with the implementation of the career education standards and the understanding of teachers themselves, subject specific teachers in, in, in a secondary school, as to the ways that their curriculum and um, their subject relates now to the world of work. Then, 
That is some work in progress with teachers themselves, so they understand when they're teaching, they can change the context of teaching for, uh, for young people, so they do get that understanding. And the teachers and the young, young people get the understanding of the relevance. Once we see that getting more embedded, and in the schools who are further ahead in this, we can see this happening, um, that opens up the, the, the thinking of the teachers and of the school as to the range of um, courses that might be possible. And so rather than doing what we might call traditional subjects in geography, they might be looking at tourism. They might be looking at land-based studies rather than um, some biology or, or chemistry. Now, that, getting that embedded at the moment there takes time. We know from the um, review of the career education standard in spring of 2017, it was launched in autumn 2015, so after 18 months we had a pledge to review um, the career education standards themselves to make sure they were fit for purpose and to make sure that they were having some kind of, of, of traction. That review pointed to the fact that um, the senior staff in schools were fully aware of the career education standards, what they were aiming to do, what the potential was, but um, it had not yet fully um, reached the teachers and the classroom. And I think the careers information and guidance um, inspections are also showing this, that that's the next stage for that to filter into the classroom. Sorry, Mr Arvson, can I just interrupt you there? Mm -hmm. um, Professor Scott is making two points. Mm -hmm. uh, first is that he believes that there is diminished subject choice, uh, right. particularly in S4, mm -hmm. and he's arguing that that's now going to impact on S5. And I have to mm -hmm. say, I think his evidence is pretty strong on that fact, and the committee's uh, agreed to uh, look at that further. The second point that he's making is that uh, the uh, youngsters themselves and parents are not being adequately informed yeah. about what is on offer in schools because, as I say, he's done this very comprehensive study of uh, handbooks and you know, the information that's disseminated from schools to the young people. And he's making the point that actually um, the young people are not always very aware because the information is not being sent to them. Yeah. My point to you, Mr mm -hmm. Armstrong, is that you, you seem to be arguing that um, there is enhanced career information. Uh, Professor Scott is saying quite the reverse. There is, but perhaps not getting that, not, we're not seeing it as widely spread in Wh Why is that? Because just because of, of the stage we are at in the implementation, because I mentioned there um, in, in spring 2017, we, we know that, that um, the career education standard was, was well understood by senior staff, but not in the classrooms. But we did check, and schools' intentions for last academic session were to do much more work in the classroom. So that is beginning to penetrate into that work. And from that, the, the more detailed, informative work with, um, in parent handbooks and discussion with parents at, at parents' evening and with children, that's how it all flows. So th there's a sequence of activity to filter down from the senior management to the teachers with their understanding to the young people, and then that then has to, has to find itself, it find its way into the advice for parents. So, so if we were to look at the school inspections overall, are you telling us that there, uh, there is more information, that the inspection process is reporting that there is better information being disseminated uh, to our young people when Professor Scott's evidence is suggesting that there's a very long way to go? Is that what we would find if we looked through No, the... what, what, what we would find in inspection um, is our young people on, on that right pathway into S3, S4, and what was the quality of the advice that they received? And what we would see in there, I'm sure John will say there, is that the, the advice they're receiving at the moment is variable. Yeah, it, it, I think, if I remember rightly, Professor mm -hmm. Scott was talking to a review he had done of school websites and school handbooks, and mm -hmm. he's right in that. I mean, we did a review too, yes. um, just midway through last year. And, and it was disappointing. It wasn't beginning to show up, you know, this range of options that we described at the beginning. So, you know, that's a piece of work that we are reminding schools to do. But it, it is often the case that the handbook and the website, unfortunately, a key tool in informing most of us and parents and the community, is often the last thing to be attended to. So what we found was that the websites were not yet reflecting what we were hearing and we knew was happening, for instance, from our development work. So, so there, is a, there is a point about you know, their, their role, if you want, in um, promoting what they're doing. Now, sometimes they're still in a state of development, so that is an issue. But, but the other thing I suppose to say, and, and I think James would probably pick up on this, is that the earlier, the formal earlier offer from um, SDS and the changed focus as a result of the you know, post-wood recommendations and what's going on now, has seen a change in 
I will put on the table, you know, we're requiring quite a lot of culture change in schools to, to make all of this work. So, for instance, um, and I say this carefully, there might have been a degree of, you know, distance from senior management level in a secondary school to what SDS were doing. It might have been seen as an add-on, the career person comes in, does this and goes away. And, and we knew that. We knew that attitudinally was sitting there. What inspection has shown over time is that the response of head teachers, for instance, to their school partnership agreement with SDS, which again sat on the side, it was something they did, that's entering into the mainstream of a secondary school's body of improvement work. And the feedback, and again, correct me, I think I'm right, is that um, the response we're getting from head teachers when we're working with them is that they see the SDS offer, that area offer, as much more meaningful. They're making better use of it in schools. They're using the data now from SDS to inform what they're doing. And importantly, they're using often one careers person in a far more, um, in a better way to support the rest of the staff. So it's not just guidance staff, what we might have seen, but all of the staff to develop their understanding of the links between what they're doing in the classroom and, and, and the wider economy. So it sounds like a catch, but it is a work in progress. And yes, I'm not surprised that Professor Scott found that on websites. Uh, thank you for, for that. Uh, w would you acknowledge uh, Education Scotland that this is actually a very serious uh, concern? Because, Mr Armstrong, you said in your opening remarks that uh, this is a more complex landscape than ever before when youngsters come to make their choices. And there are, you know, there are different pathways. And that, in my view, is a good thing. But youngsters have to know uh, in detail exactly what these options are and how they are, uh, what the qualifications are, how they're examined, etc. And it strikes me at the moment this is a mess in terms of the information that is going out to youngsters. It is not clear cut, um, and it's certainly uh, leaving them, in my view, very short as young people who are obviously the future uh, skills of, of this country. It's not, not a mess. Um, I would say that it, need, that it needs to be more informed by, uh, for example, labour market intelligence. And uh, our reviews of careers information um, advice and guidance have actually turned out to be very positive in being very good, some excellent evaluations across the local authorities um, over, in the, over the past years. But within that, the areas that need to be worked on most um, is is the obviously the implementation of the uh, enhanced uh, careers education offer from SDS, but also that the teachers and schools use of, of labour market information. That's critical, I think, to actually I'm helping schools and understand places. just exactly what needs to happen. So, as Joan said, it's work in progress and certainly an area that we know needs to improve. Okay, uh, Mr Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, to continue this theme, I'm interested in Skills Development Scotland's senior phase survey. Um, I'm glad that you do it. I've got a couple of specific questions on it, but just before that, um, in terms of your submission, it was very much focused on young people's experience of careers advisors. Um, could you just briefly explain if the survey is broader than that or if it's very much focused on experience of a careers advisor in school? Um, so it, it, it absolutely is. Um, we set out to listen to our customers' voice as part of the CIEG service, which we've been doing for many years prior to um, the Career Education Standard and DYW coming in. So we, um, as well as the Senior Face Survey, we also undertake um, the point of delivery customer feedback as well. So after group sessions and um, following one-to-one -one, um, sessions as well. Um, it used to be a school leaver survey up until last year. So it was only leavers who left, who we then gathered feedback on the services that they had received by SDS. Um, I guess in our evolution, the sophistication of our um, systems and tracking of young people, um, we are now able to ask those questions of young people based on the services that they actually received. So we remind them that those services um, have been received. Um, because to the point earlier on, um, part of this, uh, uh, part of the, the delivery of career information advice and guidance services does not lie solely with SDS. It requires teachers engaged in that and um, using the same methodology. So a lot of the focus that we are doing is around building capacity for embedding career management skills into the curriculum so that there's a common thread that runs through what support a young person gets and the language that a careers advisor uses with the support and the language that a, a teacher is also using. So at the moment, that survey absolutely is specifically focused on CIAG services um, themselves. Um, 
part of our evolution as a partnership um, through the change team programmes and, and taking forward the career education standard um, is the consideration about how we use that mechanism, actually, because we reach 3,500 young people every year. It's quite a significant cohort of individuals from senior phase. How do we use that to um, start to focus on the broader career information advice and guidance that they're getting through the school system rather than just purely from SDS? Because that really takes us to where what the career education standard has been trying to do is develop um, a network of individuals who are consistently um, providing the same or similar information using the same language to develop um, career management skills for informed decision making. So that's certainly something that we're considering. Thanks. That was useful to talk about the result last year specifically. Uh, so nine out of 10 young people uh, found their careers advisor to be friendly and approachable. That's fantastic. That was my experience not that long ago. But that then drops to 70% who were actually happy with both their ability to access support and the support that they accessed. Have you drilled into that and found out why one in five young people have that gap in experience where they found the careers advisor friendly and approachable, but clearly weren't happy with what they got? Yeah, we have um, drilled into that. So uh, one of the things to understand about that senior face survey is that that's the, the national result that we submit as part of the, uh, our report that we published last week. Um, it, when we described earlier on about the difference between the universal and targeted support, so universal services are for all young people, so it's an entitlement for every um, uh, young person in school. And that targeted support begins to come in um, uh, around that needs-based and the needs matrix that um, we have referenced, and I know that that's picked up in the papers. So there's a difference in terms of what customers or young people are actually receiving as part of that service. Um, and we don't widely publicise you know, that, that, that this is when you get targeted support and this is when you get universal support. That's more about an individual, um, their circumstances, working with the practitioner who's working with them in order to understand whether they do or they don't get targeted support. So when we drill through that survey, um, the results for universal customers, so those individuals who are maybe only receiving the face-to-face the -face engagement or the subject choice one-to-one -one, um, is starkly different from those who are receiving targeted support. And what we often find is that those young people who are receiving that universal service, their satisfaction drops because they're not getting more. Um, but we are obviously limited in terms of the, the services that we're delivering. We um, deliver against their expectations and our letter of guidance and also through the CIAG strategy. So our resources are delivering what I feel is the right mixture of that delivery. Um, what we learn from that is about how do we take that out to practitioners to manage expectations around the, um, the services that young people have, um, the support that they can access, and actually um, supporting them to know that they can get continuous targeted support, ongoing support, if um, it's agreed and um, uh, worked through with a careers advisor. So if we identify a change in someone's circumstances, we can uh, offer that enhanced support. So the satisfaction level increases uh, um, by 10% um, when we look at the targeted cohort only. Um, so that, that's the kind of differences, and that's part of our commitment in SDS to continuous improvement is about how do we then inform our practice in um, working with young people to manage expectations and be clear about the services and support they can receive. The entitlement to one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, discussions with advisors has been mentioned already. Do you survey, uh, are you aware of how many young people are themselves aware that they have that entitlement? Because this is something that's come up quite regularly with us in the informal sessions we've had with young people as well as more formal evidence and submissions, that very often they're unaware of what support they're entitled to. Yeah. I think we put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that young people are aware. We use the opportunities that we have to work with our influencers, so we make sure that parents are aware of that. Um, we spend a lot of time in school through the school partnership agreements discussing what arrangements we'll make to try and raise awareness of that as well. And young people have the opportunity not just to come along for a face-to-face -face if it's arranged in the way that we've described, but they have drop-in sessions at school in most of our schools that they can come into um, for further help. And sometimes it's from that that we identify actually that they do need further help. Um, but we do do a lot more now, I think, to promote our services, and we do that in a range of different ways. So we're a multi-channel service. So you'll see that information in schools, hopefully in most of the schools that, that you maybe have visited or that you, you'd be aware of. Um, we also have marketing materials that young people can access and their parents. We spend a lot of time talking to teachers about that as well, because teachers can refer young people for uh, support as well, if they feel that that's appropriate. So we do use a lot of different channels and opportunities to try and raise awareness and make sure that young people are aware of their entitlements. And we also closely monitor that as a service to make sure that we are actually reaching those young people who really need the help most. That's very helpful, but have you surveyed young people to find out what they're aware of in terms of their entitlements? 
I'll, I'll come back in a little bit on this then. Okay. Um, there are entitlements set out in the career standard, and I'm not sure if they're the same ones you're referring to, but there are 10 of them there, which includes critically the, mm. the, the SDS office. Um, just to give some idea of progress there, we're absolutely pushing on all angles in terms of um, how children and young people are made aware that these entitlements exist in the first place. And um, I think you've heard us say that there's a lot of work going on with, uh, across schools and wider practitioners into the community and community learning development so that people are aware that these entitlements exist. Um, what we're finding um, is, for instance, um, when you check on inspection evidence, and, and as we speak today, inspectors will be in secondary schools and they will be in primary schools and they will be asking um, in schools, how aware are the young people in this um, establishment of these particular entitlements? So, so that work, that work uh, will bring uh, feedback um, towards mid-year and, and towards the end of the year. Um, but the other interesting thing is, I think uh, Alan mentioned um, um, career information and um, guidance reviews have taken place since 2014. Um, we're now in the stage where um, some of the follow-up to the local authority, that's on a local authority basis, uh, some of these follow-ups are beginning to happen. And what we've seen, for instance, in one local authority where they got a reasonably good, a good um, uh, review, but there was a recommendation in there about these entitlements, about teachers and parents being made aware and, and youngsters themselves. And what we see, there's just been a revisit, and that came out um, very positively in terms of the awareness in that local authority of young people's um, access to their entitlements. So, Again, it's a work in progress. Okay. No, that's, that's useful. And just one final question, convener. Um, something that's come up quite regularly with us uh, in feedback from young people is where there are choices that aren't really a choice for them, where schools might have, uh, on paper, expanded the number of options available to young people, but for the individual young person, they don't feel that it was ever really a choice, that they were, I don't want to use the word railroaded because I think it's quite a loaded term, but they certainly felt like they were being directed towards one of a range of options and the others weren't really an option for them. What is the role for a careers advisor in that situation? Are careers advisors empowered to address that with schools? So I think we have a really important role to play around the uh, curricular choices that people make, particularly as you've heard already, we have uh, an input around uh, either second or third year. Um, that's a face-to-face -face intervention, but it's also um, an opportunity to speak to parents and teachers as well, if we feel that that's appropriate. Um, and part of what we're trying to do whilst we're having those conversations is to look at what the options and um, opportunities might be in the future and to help young people, their parents, teachers, to, to look at that in the context and the circumstances in which that young person is learning. But as part of that, it may well be that they look at a career route or a career option and our job is to try and keep their options as open as possible at that stage. Um, and what they would then help the, to develop is their career management skills in order to be able to understand how they might go about accessing that. And as part of that conversation, they may then identify particular qualifications that they require in order to pursue that career. Whether or not they're available in school uh, is something that obviously we would discuss with them, but our focus isn't necessarily around which subjects they're going to choose at that point in time. It's a much broader conversation, I think, than that. Um, so in terms of our influence in a particular school, where they might not be able to access something, it would come back to some of the points that were made earlier about looking at what those opportunities might be more widely, rather than within that actual school for them to access it. Well, what I was talking about is perhaps slightly different from that. It's not that the options aren't available in the school, it's perhaps that the options are available, but the, the school or individuals within the school have essentially decided that those options are not available for that individual young person. That's anecdotal feedback that we get really quite regularly. It would be fair to say, and it's, I think it's, it's the extent of culture change that needs to happen. There's still, um, go, back, go back to my analogy of the <laughs> linear um, uh, progression in there, parents are used to one system. Teachers are used to, to that same system. Employers are used to that system, and employers know their needs. And what we need to do is to harmonize the two so that um, the, exactly what it is that, that employers need by the way of the future workforce then actually influences the schools and helps to influence the choice choices young people make with their parents' consent that actually university may not be the best thing for you. Um, it may actually be better to do a foundation apprenticeship, modern apprenticeship, up to a degree level in the workplace, 
um, by the time you're 21, 22 or, or, or whatever, for all the benefits that will have for the economy and for their own personal finances in there. Um, and actually learning on the job, it can be incredibly valuable. Now that's a cultural change that we're working with SDS on, working with parents. We've got strong links with the National Parent Forum of, of Scotland who are very keen to help us with this as well. And it's a very, very important element of the whole DYW agenda. Yeah, I'll come back to your original question. question. Um, the careers advisors in schools, um, there are dedicated staff from SDS working within the schools, and we negotiate that service through the school partnership agreement. Um, so they may not be empowered to change what's happening um, in relation to the curriculum, but certainly they're seen as part of that school team. And through the development of the career education standard and that collaboration, um, uh, it's raised the visibility of what that offer does and the contribution that it makes to the wider information advice and guidance. So we are in informing and influencing senior management teams and head teachers around what we are hearing from young people. And I think the important point in all of this, we are, uh, there are experiences, uh, as you're describing there, of people feeling that they're being driven into different environments for different reasons. I think the value that comes from having a professionally qualified careers advisor at subject choice um, is exactly what it was intended to do. It's almost a pause for a young person, so it's impartial. It challenges the decision making that they're making. It understands what influences have actually got them to that point, um, and it helps them work through the reality of what those decisions are going to look like, as Sharon's described, both now and in the long term. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a, a quick question about the survey that um, Mr Greer had been asking about? It says there's 3,573 youngsters responded to that. How many were given the opportunity to respond? Uh, so it's about 50,000 young people that we hold email, valid email addresses for. So we go through a very technical solution to make sure that they're real email addresses. Um, and we match that with those young people who are also registered in My World of Work. So we've seen quite a significant increase in that. Um, so the, it's around about 50,000 people who we have the email addresses for, and that, then that starts to represent about an 8 or 9% um, response rate, um, but which is statistically robust in terms of the results that we're putting out there. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Can I bring Ms. Goldruth in? Thank you, Convener. I'd like to pick up, James Russell, on your point you just made in response to Ross Greer there with regard to careers based advisors in uh, sorry, careers advisors based in schools. Um, and you said they're not empowered to change course choices. I just wonder if you could perhaps tell the committee on average how many hours a careers advisor might spend in a school in a week, for example. So that would depend. We have a, a it depends on the number of pupils that are in that school. Um, so right. for example, in Sharon's area, she has a school with um, four thousand pupils and so we have um, three careers advisors based in that school so in terms of delivering sorry, that did universal you say a, a school with 4,000 pupils in it sorry two, two sorry 2,000 <laughs> right <laughs> um, so we have about 2.5 FTE working in that in that space so we uh, review that on an annual basis and um, we look at the population and the census data that comes through um, via CMIS um, and then we adjust our resources to ensure that we can deliver the targeted and universal support that we set out. Um, so it will depend. You, we have some advisors maybe in rural areas who are there two or three days a week, um, one day a week, for example, or we have a number of advisors. But I think it's important to recognise that it's always a dedicated individual, so it's the same person that's working in that school throughout the year and then on an annual basis. And if your careers advisors are not based in schools, where are they if they're not in the school? For the whole week? Are they out and about in other schools or are they based in a central location then in the local authority area? Yep. So generally speaking, if, if I give, take an example that James gave, those advisors are in school four and a half days a week each, um, so they are more or less full time. We do make time um, half a day per week to come back into the centre, so they're linking back in with other staff. They would attend staff meetings, undertake CPD, which is really, really crucial for our expert um, advisors. But in other areas, it might be done differently. So it may be they have a school caseload and they may also work with unemployed young people as well. So it, it's different in different geographies and different circumstances. OK. I just want to move on to look at subject choice with regard to gender segregation, um, because the equality section of the Developing Young People Workforce uh, Progress Report made a specific reference to uh, reducing gender stereotypes and segregation in course choice. I'd be interested to hear about some of the work that's been done on that by Education Scotland and, and by SDS as well. Okay, um, I'm happy to take that one. Um, 
We've uh, done a lot of work on gender um, and it's again a feature, a very strong feature in what we're asking in the career education standard from early years onwards. So, you know, in, a, in an early learning and childcare setting today, we are asking uh, staff in there and the people working with young people to think very heavily about the gender stereotyping that might be around the opportunities for play when they're, when they're playing or dressing up as somebody from work. So that has carried through to... Um, we've just completed with SDS and the Institute of Physics a, a very successful um, programme um, in Fife and other schools uh, on improving gender balance. And that the, the, the findings of that were um, launched and disseminated in June, just before the summer. And that really tackled a huge number of issues um, relating to gender uh, across the piece. That's been regarded as very successful. Um, practitioners, teachers have found it very useful. Um, we'll now go on and pick up on that work. And as we move into um, the area of uh, regional collaboratives emerging, um, we're hoping with the recent recruitment, um, at the moment we're looking for um, improving gender balance staff um, who will help take that work forward across the country. So we've learned a lot from that and, and, I can, and we can see progress. <laughs> been involved in the delivery of the, the Improving Gender Balance project and uh, what that's taken us to is um, the development of resources and um, so careers advisors particularly um, uh, postgraduate qualified have a, an element of that as part of their learning and training um, and back to the point earlier on about challenging the choices that they're making um, mm -hmm. in a positive way but that, that absolutely is about um, ensuring that the young person is making the right choice and that includes um, uh, ex exploring um, gender segregation and occupational segregation and the influences that are um, informing those choices at that point in time. So we undertake CLPL or CPD for our staff. We've developed that in conjunction with Education Scotland as well. Um, and then there's also a, a, a teacher's uh, resource that's been developed um, to be aware of that and to understand where those specific challenges are existing, which occupations, so back to the labour market information, which occupations, which industries, um, so that that can be raised um, uh, uh, with young people to see that they understand why that, that has happened. And I back to again, you know, it's a cultural change. Um, but I think all of the influencers need to understand what that position looks like and we've got our, uh, certainly our role in supporting them um, with the information that we share with them. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think obviously certain schools are better at tackling gender segregation than others. So I wonder, therefore, is there a role for Education Scotland in, in tackling that and actually in tracking course choices across the country in terms of gender and looking at what the national picture is? Um, and I wonder as well, does Education Scotland provide any advice with regard to the gender composition of a class? So, for example, if you have an advanced higher physics class in which there are 16 pupils and only one girl, does any advice and guidance go out to schools in terms of, of how to challenge that or, and actually how to stop that kind of thing from arising in the first instance? That is exactly the kind of work that um, the Improving Gender Officers will, will be doing. We've had a pilot running, I think, for two years Institute with the uh, Institute of Chemistry? Institute Physics. Physics, of course. Institute of Physics part funded these posts along with SDS to look at this cr critical element really in advance of, of the STEM strategy being developed in there. Um, that has proved to be very successful. We've learnt from um, uh, some of the actions that were taken in schools, uh, just exactly how to help with, with this whole situation. Um, at last week's Scottish Learning Festival, uh, which the committee couldn't come to actually in there. But on the Thursday, we had a STEM day, a whole day focused on STEM. And there were three um, intriguing uh, short presentations by young people in the morning. And it's worth looking at them on the web, actually, um, where you saw the stark difference. Um, there was the last person that spoke was a, a young woman who left school poss possibly two years ago. And didn't know what to do when she was at school in terms of her future careers. She, this was pre enhanced career in, um, information, didn't know what to do. Um, and she uh, moved school as fortuitously in S5. And in, in her S6, her technology teacher opened her mind to what they called a multi-trade course in S6. And that, she went out with the council workers two days a week. Um, and that really opened her mind to what she was doing. She's now a second year apprentice plasterer, et cetera, in there. And she knows that she did not receive the right information well. The corollary to that was the first person spoke who was a primary seven pupil who um, had become a science lab technician in her primary school. And she had to apply, she had to go through an interview, 
and she was then leading others, well, male and females, boys and girls, in that school on science. Now, that's an example, really, of, of us you know, seeing those early wins coming through. Uh, it will take time, but I think we're working at it from a whole range of angles. And how will Education Scotland capture that good practice and share it then with other schools? Will it be done through a website or...? It's done in a whole number of ways. I mean, that, all of that is captured on the, the findings and the projects that went... Uh, I mean, you know, you'd, your example of noticing that there's one girl in a class of X number mm -hmm. of boys. These are exactly the things that were being worked with in, in the schools concerned. Um, and, and all of that was, you know... I suppose made very very clear you know it, it, how a teacher speaks in a class who are they taking answers from you know it, are they responding to the boys first or are they responding to the girls first yeah. and does that you know vary across subject area and of course that's what was all unearthed as part of this work it was fascinating mm -hmm. that's all available um it's certainly on the website but it's on the it's with we'll work with our material with these new gender officers across mm -hmm. each of the weeks to to um to make sure that that's um everybody's aware of that and just, just finally, but the, the reason for placing them with the regional collaboratives is that we're, Education Scotland are looking to have, a, to have a, a team of people around about literacy, numeracy, health, wellbeing, STEM and the, the gender. That will then begin to take things much, much more across the curriculum and to help all the teachers to understand the connections across, just as Joan said, everyday learning and teaching without thinking about even you know, the, those careers we want more women in. It's a natural, becomes a natural part of learning and teaching and young people's expectations that the gender bias issues um, are uh, covered. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're moving on to the uh, achieving the developing young workforce priorities. I'm going to bring in Mr Mundell. Hi, thank you, convener. Um, I just wondered, first of all, um, how well do you think that DYW is achieving its aims across the country? I'll, I'll yep. start with that. Um, I guess I would like to go back to a point that Terry Lanigan made um, back in June uh, as part of this inquiry um, that we are halfway through uh, quite a significant change programme. I think the, the key difference for me around um, DYW is the length of time um, that uh, has been enabled in order to um, undertake um, and elicit that change in the system, um, which is already changing. You know, the, the, the world of work is consistently changing, so the recommendations that we had um, back then are, are starting to be challenged with what the landscape is currently looking like for us. Um, but certainly from um, our point of view, there's no denying that there has been progress in this, and it goes back to the point I made earlier on that we would expect um, a level of progress or a pace of progress to be different at the front end of this change programme um, than we would at the back end. And I think a lot of the infrastructures now in place, so the capacity building, the, the, um, the relationships, those uh, hub um, delivery models around FAs, the employer school relationships, um, that gives us a real opportunity to work towards achieving what DYW set out for the whole seven year programme. So, um, so uh, you know, from our point of view, the career education standard, the recommendations around career information, advice and guidance for young people broadly, um, and all the people who are involved in that, um, we are starting to see progress through the Education Scotland reviews of CIAG services. Some great examples of you know, lo whole local authorities um, changing their entire curriculum structure, having it running the same across the local authorities to ensure that those opportunities start um, existing for more young people. They're building it in, in times that means that the travel is not taken away from other parts. You know, and um, there's a lot of learning that's been taking place as part of this change programme. Um, and I think the progress that we're making um, is also reflected in the KPIs, that there's incremental um, progress being made year on year against those. I'm happy to, um, you know, there's 39 recommendations uh, from the original report, and they then break down into something like 124 sub-recommendations. So, and then across the, the vastness of the programme, um, there's been a lot of um, interdependency and complexity. Um, what I see as just beyond the midpoint now is that um, pretty well everything is lined up. You know, there was a point in time when um, you couldn't push on one bit until another bit was in place. For instance, waiting for the DYW employer groups to get themselves up and running. That's now in place. So we're in an interesting place now where, um, from where I sit, everything is in place. And I think that the job now is, is one of um, pretty well relentless focus in delivering um, the ambitions of the programme in the next two to three years. Um, so you'd be absolutely confident that the targets are going to be met in, uh, by the end of the, the funded period? 
I am confident that we are going to see a change. Remember, what we're looking for is system change. That's, that's a big ask. It's system change that is sustainable. This can't be seen as another initiative, something like it has done in the past. It can't be something that stops when the programme stops. Um, so that's to what we're gearing all our efforts towards. And, and we've already mentioned the significant culture change that we, we're having to work on um, to, to ensure that that system change actually happens and is sustained beyond the life of the programme. And you're, you're confident that uh, there's sufficient financial resource going to be available uh, to, to, to ensure that that you know, activity is sustainable right across the country? I, I probably don't have too much comment on the financial resource. I'm probably not best placed to, to make a comment on that. I think there are three strong indicators in, in the, the, the progress for me. One is that relationships are now growing with the right partners. That would include the employers and the parents and everybody in, involved in this. There's genuine collaboration. It's not partnership, it's genuine collaboration in there, not just from the national agencies, but um, in schools and within local authorities. And there's shared expectations shared expectations from us, whether it's about um, a, the gender bias or uh, the need for better careers information in school, uh, when, uh, option choice. There's a clear understanding and shared expectations in there. So relationships, collaboration and expectations, I think, are really strong. OK. Uh, the final question that I want to ask is slightly unrelated, but do you think that there's too much focus on employers' needs? I've heard that mentioned a couple of times. Uh, this morning, and it's certainly a worry for me. Uh, I think the DYW group in the recent Galway are doing a, a great job, uh, but ultimately a lot of the activity seems to be focused on supporting uh, employers uh, and, and, and young people to sort of match, match them up locally, rather than focusing on young people's potential, what they may want to do. Um, and you know, I have a concern uh, when I hear you know, that we're widening the option choice but within some of the option choices uh, for bright young people uh, who maybe come from disadvantaged backgrounds who want to pursue a traditional academic route, actually the choices and the support available to them uh, has, has got weaker or lost focus in order to support some other activities. That's something we, we need to have a sharp eye on in ourselves in talking to young people in schools and in community learning settings, um, is that you know, they genuinely feel that the course and they are, the courses they're on, the range of, of courses they're on, actually meets their own expectations. And that's part of actually a young person, and right from the earlier stages, understanding what their, what their career options might be. So they're able to articulate these and talk about their skills at a much earlier stage, be aware of them, of them and talk about them so that they're um, a, well informed, but also the, 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 the teachers and parents are, are well informed. But we certainly would not want a, a situation where our young person's aspirations were, were bound by the need of a local employer, where actually that young person could become something different. Uh, that's very, very important. It's, it's about young person's needs as well as the, the, the economy needs. Do, do, do you think that the current programme's got that balance right? That's really what I'm asking because I, yes. I mean I, I, yes. I, I don't see I, I don't see uh, middle class uh, pupils who, who have these connections and, and, and inbuilt advantages that they're not changing their mind as far as I can see away from university and wanting to no. to work in local businesses they're continuing on no. that path mm. and what's happening is a lot of the initiatives end up targeting yeah. you yes. know, a, a group of bright uh, people uh, you know who maybe don't have the same advantages to whom things then appear an attractive option uh, when they're not given the full support they deserve. I would agree that's an issue at, at the moment and I think that's exactly, but there are, the drivers are in place to, to address that and I mentioned earlier um, the, the work of the, of the science centres in reaching out, working with families, family learning, you know, kind of things. Now that again needs to get itself embedded into the system but again the, the drive is there for that. I think we're acutely aware of um, that perception playing out, so we we absolutely have that in mind, that it's the children's needs first. That's an absolute driver in everything we're doing. Absolutely. If I could just say something on that point, um, the work that Joan referenced there earlier on about looking at um, what evidence exists at a school level to support um, their planning for their curriculum in the school and also through the, the kind of FE um, uh, provision in the area. Um, the 16 plus data hub, um, which is part of the opportunities for all, um, tracking young people's outcomes um, and uh, SDS are heavily involved through um, uh, identifying where those young people are um, if they're not in school. Um, and 
part of that is a, a huge amount of work that's been undertaken to um, support schools to input information into that about young people's um, status and destination, but it also includes information about the preferred occupations and preferred routes. So it gives us a chance to use that information. A lot of the focus has been getting um, that data um, as complete as it possibly can, um, but we're already starting to see some um, emerging local authorities using that information to inform their curriculum planning um, for themselves and for, for the college. So it's looking at the supply and demand, and if they are mismatched in some way, shape or form, that has implications for all of us, and I guess that, that needs to be part of the evolution of DYW and how we use evidence and information to inform very targeted and specific improvement, rather than at the front end of that, which was um, broad uh, infrastructure being built into the system. So uh, that, that's certainly something that's on all of our horizons about how we use, help schools to use that data more effectively. Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I just wanted to continue this conversation about employers. Uh, the vast majority of employers in, in Scotland are, certainly in the private sector, are SMEs less than five employees. What support is out there to encourage employers to get involved in the programme? Yes, I can start that off. Um, so again, it's important to recognise um, SDS has a very specific role in that space, um, working alongside Scottish Enterprise um, and also the DYW groups um, in supporting employers. So I can certainly talk about the support that we have available for them. Um, so we uh, work with and uh, account manage a, a group of employers um, uh, to understand what their business needs look like. Um, and there's a programme called uh, Skills for Growth, which um, enables employers to build their capacity to um, either export or to um, undertake workforce development. So we have a small team in SDS who works with those employers, and part of that programme of understanding their needs and um, supporting them to improve or develop um, their organisation um, also includes what uh, skills programmes are available to help them do that. That would be the apprenticeship family in its entirety. So is that an employer that can become part of an FA delivery model, or is it something that maybe in modern apprenticeships would more support the succession planning requirements of those organisations? Um, so that's, I guess, one aspect of that. Um, we have uh, sector teams, um, industry leadership groups, um, and we also obviously have uh, Scottish Apprenticeship Advisory Board, um, who are influential in um, supporting employers to understand the range of activity that they can get involved in. Because I think a lot of what we've discussed today here is that awareness is the first point for anybody to make any change. And if they, don't, if they aren't aware, how, how do we expect them to do that? Um, so it's raising the profile of um, learning and skills and the benefits to employers around what um, learning skills pathways and programmes are available to support their organisations. Um, and in Marketplace, which we've developed with the DYW groups, the implementation of that um, is in um, situ at the moment. So there's about seven or eight groups currently using that um, with a clear plan through the DYW lead SG um, to implement that across all of those groups. So we support, we developed the infrastructure around that with DYW, and um, it's about promoting that um, to employers. Uh, and, you know, some of the comments that we hear is that employers don't know what to do to get involved with schools. Um, so Marketplace tries to give them an idea of the different types of activities that they may be able to put themselves up for. Um, but absolutely, if an employer requires further support beyond that um, in terms of not knowing what to do but wanting to get involved, um, there are many routes that we can support them with in order to be able to do that. I mean, your KPIs, uh, KPI 6, 10 and 11, is about increasing employability for young people, disabled people and for people from care backgrounds. Um, but you mentioned Marketplace. Marketplace, according to the information we have, has only 300 registered employers. Now, putting public sector to one side, private sector has 363,000. So, I mean, you know, it sounds to me as, as if it's a minute number. And, you know, do we know what the makeup of the Marketplace um, employers is? Is it predominantly large employers that are there, or is it public sector employers? I mean, who, who have registered the marketplace? So we have a mixture. I mean, we have an approach. So uh, um, national employers who have multiple offers across the country, um, we work either with ourselves and our teams or through Scottish Enterprise, because many of these employers may be account managed in different ways across um, the entire landscape. Um, 
So it, it's helping them to understand how they can broaden that reach. So there are some national employers that are part of that. Um, and then we move into the SME um, sector um, and the public sector. So we support a public sector network. So we have a public sector network that um, develops their approach to uh, learning and skills and supporting young people in their choices um, as an employer, absolutely. Um, I don't have the exact breakdown of what those numbers look like at this stage. It's certainly something that I could follow up. Um, but it's important to note that we are only not even halfway through that, but we're a third of the way through getting those groups engaged. And as Joan referenced earlier on, the timescales of having all those employer groups in place, it should be about using the networks of the DYW employer groups to then interface into marketplace. And we have an evolution that we can go through in terms of meeting their needs as part of that. I mean, I, mean, I appreciate it. it's a work in progress and, you know, we will get further down the line as, as it's going on. But the DYW regional groups, how much involvement of SMEs are, are in those DYW groups? I wouldn't be able to answer no. that and right I, now for you. I don't think we have that data to hand uh, yet. Um, I think what, what's happening on the ground is that that's exactly what these groups are doing. You know, they're looking in the localities of schools and in the community surrounding schools, and a lot of them are very busy engaging and making approaches to um, SMEs to see what's possible. And again, I can only be anecdotal at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've heard of um, situations where several SMEs, it might be one, two, up to ten employers, have maybe grouped together. And in that grouping, they have offered to be either a mentor for a young person. Uh, there's some um, good examples of that coming through. <coughs> that um, it might be an individual one-to-one. -one. That's one of the strengths sometimes that come through. Um, again, that could be because of local knowledge um, or in the community. So there's a variety of um, things coming through. Now, our role in that is to, um, first of all, support culture change. I mean, one of the one of the issues has been helping schools and employers to understand how to talk to each other. You know, that one isn't demanding of the other. It, they have to enter into a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. Um, and our role would be to advise government on if there's any particular blockages in that. But again, we're still in this interesting place where um, the developing the young workforce employer groups um, are getting, in some cases, up to speed. And, and we are seeing good work there. We're, see, we're seeing the contacts being made. But yes, uh, so I, I wouldn't take marketplace as the only indication at the moment of what's going on, on the ground. Again, it's the same story. OK, thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to move on to inclusivity and support. I've got a number of members um, wanting in on this, so I'm mindful of times so if people could be keep the questions succinct and answers succinct as well. It would be helpful at this stage. Um, but can I bring in first Mary Fee? So, um, convener, I wanted to ask the panel about care experienced um, young people because it's widely known that care experienced young people have poorer outcomes. Um, and the figures show that there's only been a, a two per, less than a 2% increase in the number of care experienced young people reaching a positive destination since 2012. And it's recognised that quite often care experienced young people need intensive and personalised support. So can I ask the panel what specific supports are, are available for care experienced young people? I think, um, if I can start initially on that one, the um, meeting the needs of care experienced young people is part of a much wider picture within the Scottish Government, within the education mm -hmm. agenda, as you'll be aware, through the Excellence and Equity, through the Pupil Equity Fund and, and so on in there. So we need to, I think, look at this um, question through the lens of everything that's going on to help young people and to help um, you know, every young person thrive for, um, from there. The, there's a lot of work um, going on with multi-agency, I would say, across um, ed with Education Scotland and with others, to look specifically at the needs of um, that group in there. Joan, you've got some I think, examples. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this is a challenge. This, this whole area is a challenge because of the level of individual support that's needed. And, and again, I would reiterate what Alan said. What, what we're trying to focus on is the aspect from the DYW angle of what works, what works for these young people when they are transitioning from one stage to another. And in our case, it's, it's from um, whatever setting they're in, into employment um, or, or into other further positive destinations. So that's very much what, what we're looking at. And 
we are making progress, but it's it's slow and steady progress. You know, it's it's fairly incremental, and it's working in that space that that Alan described there. That we're learning from what works in the interventions from the Scottish Attainment Challenge, what's happening on the ground locally. Um, I think some of, i give you an example that, that comes to mind. Some of the committee, and I'm, I'm not sure if all of the committee um, were present, might have visited, for instance, Scran Academy, am I right in thinking that, in, in, in the north of Edinburgh? And that, that was a project very much uh, set up in combination with, at the time, Craig Royston High School, a, a teacher leading on that, working with CLD in the local community, and creating a pathway for a whole cohort of young people. Now, that's an example of um, youngsters being motivated and supported through a route from fairly f um, challenging circumstances. Um, that's the kind of thing that we're learning from. We're drawing out what works. And again, sometimes that's passing on advice in terms of barriers to Scottish government colleagues who are working in that area on, on, on policy. Um, but that's what we're working on, capturing what works for care experienced young people without focus very much on what helps them develop the confidence and the skills in order to be able to progress um, beyond where they are. Um, yeah, Mr Russell? You can pick up from um, a, a direct delivery service to, to young people. Um, so the targeted support that we um, mentioned earlier on that's been described as part, uh, part of our submission. Um, identifies the socio-economic factors for young people. So um, it, it uses those factors um, to ha allow the careers advisor and the practitioner who's supporting that young person, whether it's pastoral support or guidance, um, to make an informed decision about the level of support that they would get. And one of those socio-economic factors that would identify a young person for our maximum level of support, if you like, um, is through care experience. Um, but we, and that's care experience in any sense, not just the, the kind of one year definition um, that, that some of the statistics are reporting against. So um, we're able to uh, uh, validate what that service level looks like for that young person based on their circumstances, because it may be that they are a, a, a you know, supported young person with clear career pathways in mind, etc. Um, so we're able to identify them through that. Um, the enhanced offer um, on the back of the Career Education Standard, where we brought that um, enhanced support into S3, so we can start that validation <coughs> and, and, and intensive support with a young person from an earlier age. And we mustn't also forget that um, the post-school services that we offer um, are effectively a continuum of the relationship that we have with young people from school into post-school for those that haven't um, moved into a positive destination. So as part of our corporate parenting plan, because we were identified as an organisation who, uh, as a corporate parent, um, we extended the intensity of that ongoing support for young care experienced individuals up to their 26th birthday. So that it creates quite a significant window of opportunity, which uh, it, absolutely it would be what a career intervention or career guidance support would look like. That's not the entirety of it. But what we do do is use our network to ensure that whoever's working with that young person or who needs to work with that young person, we can bring them into um, that environment as part of their learning programme. So there's, a, there's a, a commitment there from a service delivery point of view and also through partnership to extend that. Okay. So if, if, the, if the assessment of needs is done correctly and, and you produce a, a needs ma matrix and, and children are put at the heart of all of this, if all of that is done correctly and you assess the needs of care experienced young people, why is the percentage of care experienced young people achieving positive destinations only increased by less than 2% since 2012? Well, we can only play our part in that in terms of the services that we're delivering. And it goes back to everything that we've talked about today, about the, the broader support and the information, advice and guidance for all young people and the influencers around their peer groups, um, their parents and carers, um, or lack of um, in many senses. So um, we can certainly put into place the support mechanisms that we can um, deploy our resources towards. Um, and then build the capacity in the way that we've described today um, in order to understand how we support other people to do that. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we've outlined as part of our corporate parent plan is being able to have um, accurate and up-to-date data on all of those young people who are um, care experienced or have experienced um, care in any way, shape or form. So we're exploring how we get data sharing agreements or some way of identifying that at a local authority level, which don't currently exist. So there's many, uh, I guess, challenges that um, exist out there in, in terms of being able to provide mm. the support. But I, I guess certainly we can put as much 
um, into the support that we give young people and um, work with our partners to connect those pieces of support as best we can. Okay. So if I go back to my original question, which was what specific support is put in place for, for care experienced children and what you've described as a system of support that is available to all children that are identified that have a support need. There is nothing specific that is targeted to care experienced children. So sorry if I've not described that, but um, no, what you've described is, is, is a, a system of support that you assess the need of a child yep. and you put the support in place. Absolutely. It's recognised that care experienced children have more challenges and need more support. So the question I asked was, what specific support do you put in place when you have identified a care experienced young person? Specifically, what do you put in place to support that person? In addition to supports that may be put in place for other children that have additional support needs? So your uh, highest level of service or support and what does that look like? go to those young people. So that's uh, an ongoing long-term relationship with that young person. So in an example, if we are validating that need on an ongoing basis, we could work from primary, uh, S3 with that young person all the way through until they leave school and then up to their 26th birthday. So that extension of that service in the post-school setting is absolutely specific to our corporate parent plan and our commitment to care experience young people. Our targeted support and the needs matrix that we use um, takes account of those care experienced young people and ensuring they get the support that they need. So it is specific to those mm. individuals. It's not just what everybody else gets. And, and do you have the resources available to deliver that? Because um, the, the figures would suggest that, that you don't when there's less than a 2% increase in positive destinations. Well, I, I guess it's not uh, solely SDS's responsibility to deliver a, a, an improvement for those young people. It requires the whole system to change their mechanisms and undertake the support levels that, that, that they do. So I can't comment on any of that. We certainly deploy the resources that we have um, in the best way that we can to give the most um, support to those who need it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Allen, you wanted in this one. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I was uh, keen to ask about another group that's perhaps underrepresented traditionally or in the past in, um, in, uh, in the world of, of work, and that is young people with disabilities. Uh, and I was keen to know what you as an organisation are able to do to try to uh, improve the figures around that and also to provide support specifically to young people who are thinking about uh, their career options at young people with uh, disabilities. Sure. So, from an SDS point of view, again, um, the, as I've just described, that needs-based approach um, would identify any um, disability or health condition that a young person may have as a factor that may indicate that they require a greater level of support. So, we'd apply the same principles around individualised support. And I think that the service we deliver from a career information advice and guidance point of view is for the individual. So. The, the system that we have round about that gives us a way of working with that young person and allocating a level of service that, that meets their needs. So that is done on an individual basis, absolutely the same way as I've described for um, care experienced young people. And you've, you've already made the point that it's not up to yourselves to fix all problems in society, and I appreciate that point, but do you as organisations work with employers where the, the, perhaps instinctively you might think the primary barrier exists towards young people with disabilities getting what I mean what do you do to try and overcome some of those perceptions um, so we have and um, we deliver the modern apprenticeship program for example so um, there's enhanced funding for employers and young people who um, have um, disabilities and additional support needs in order to be able to um, put that support into place to sustain them through that program for up to 52 weeks um, so there is uh, additional support there um, and we uh, do uh, a lot of work with employers so one of the most recent pieces um, is about recruitment guides so how do we support employers to um, be fully inclusive and open around um, and be aware of the different aspects that may play into their recruitment practices and their selection processes um, to make them more fair and more open um, so there are there is different pieces of work that we do with employers in order to be able to support them to um, bring young disabled people into their organisation and support them effectively while they're there because it does require a level of support that they may not um, experience all the time. But are any of you able to say anything about what might be done to overcome conscious or unconscious bias on the part of employers, which is something obviously that disabled people themselves cite as what they perceive as one of the obstacles to work? Again, I think that's uh, something we're very aware of as we're working with the DYW employer groups. 
Um, it's to, uh, and that was one of the issues, for instance, getting one of the things we looked at early on was getting work placements for young people with disabilities. Um, the definition of young people with disabilities, of course, has variation in it, vast variation in it. Um, and, and that's something you have to unpack almost continuously. And um, I see cautiously, you know, that some people rate some disabilities in different ways. You know, so there's a huge complexity sitting within, if you want, that very wide grouping of young people. And so, again, um, what we've sought to do as an organisation is to help people that we can influence and work with to understand, first of all, that they're not capping the limit. That's a huge thing on a young person who's perceived or actually has a disability. And that that isn't stopping, you know, at this, for instance, at the school level, uh, the school saying, well, you can't because, for instance, undertake a work placement. Um, the other side of that, obviously, is having a situation in which that young person can flourish, that there is an employer willing to... Um, offer that young person a work placement. So that's exactly where we are just now, working on the um, all the, again, the cultural and attitudinal um, things that we need to do, as well as putting, you know, what's the exact um, level of support that needs to go into place. We've learned a lot from um, the number of organisations who are in, in the field here. Um, one of these was obviously quoted in the original commission report, and that's Enable, who have had a high degree of success across 11 or so authorities working with young people with disabilities. They have a very high success rate in getting them into positive destinations. So we've captured the learning from that um, and are working with a number of other area, a number of other um, third sector and, and active organisations who are able to support young people in, in that situation. And, and finally, and, and just the other point I wanted to make around it, uh, you've phrased it yourself there about work placements. Um, uh, anecdotally, tell me if I'm wrong, but anecdotally one of the, the problems in the past about um, encouraging more work placements for everyone and work experience for everyone has been sometimes the attitudes of uh, employers around issues like insurance. Um, presumably there are all sorts of misconceptions to be overcome um, when it comes to insurance for people with, with disabilities on, on work experience. And what's being what's being done specifically to try and overcome some of those anxieties on the part of employers to make sure that people with disabilities get the same opportunities as everyone else? Well, again, that's exactly it. There's a number of issues like that, health and safety issues, for instance. We discovered um, uh, that on the West Coast, <laughs> there was a completely different set of rules about allowing young children into maritime type work placements compared with the East Coast. You know, there's all sorts of interesting anomalies that have been thrown up as we've worked our way through all of this. Um, so what, um, you know, what Cal Mac would allow on one side, P&O wouldn't allow on the other side and so on. So there was, there was, there's all sorts of interesting problems. So we just have to take them on a, you know, almost a case by case basis to understand where the blockers sit. So it takes us into very interesting territory, but that's ongoing. Yeah, I'm very aware of that. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. I've got two members still waiting to come in this. If they could be um, succinct, that would be really helpful. I can ask Joanne Lamont. Okay, thanks. It's really to follow on from those issues. I'm interested in, first of all, the, the level of training you have in relation to dealing with different um, additional support needs. Um, so, for example, um, last night I was at a launch of a report called not included, not engaged, not involved for with Scottish Autism, National Autistic Society and Children in Scotland. And they've produced very worrying evidence about the extent to which young people are excluded from school either informally or formally or in part-time timetables and therefore are not um, secured in education. I wonder how you factor in an understanding of that to the support that you would give to a young person with autism um, because I think there would be lessons from that for other things that exclude people. But this is a good example of a young person who may not be in school regularly, maybe um, because of the circumstances are not um, supported to stay in school. What do you do to make sure that their opportunities to access proper careers advice is there? If you want, yeah. So the, the, I think we do that through a number of different approaches. The one that you've touched on, I think, is absolutely crucial, which is partnership working. So using specialist agencies and people with expertise. We don't expect our frontline careers advisors to have that kind of knowledge and expertise, but they need to know how to access that in order to put together a package of support for a young person. So what we'd also do is work really closely with our schools who have that kind of in-depth knowledge of young people. And you're right to say that some young people are not in that school setting. 
So we have staff who are able to go out and do that kind of intermediary role and provide support if a young person isn't able to come to us to access it, which, which can be really important for a young person. And it comes back to some points we made earlier as well um, about changing perceptions in terms of employers and how we would hope to try and make sure that we have a package of support around that young person that's based on the reality of the opportunities that are there, but always being aspirational for that young person, and in particular paying attention to their you know, personal needs uh, and their own aspirations and their own desires, and trying wherever we can to make sure that the information, advice and guidance that we give to them is in line with that, and building their own capacities so that they are successful in their transitions, that they sustain those, and that there's a long-term future for that young person. We also do invest a lot in CPD for our own staff, using other agencies. So we've worked with, we haven't touched on mental health today, but that's one of the issues that's been really prevalent, I guess, in terms of the work that we do, and making sure that our staff are fully aware of all the resources that are available to young people so that they can bring those to bear. Another important thing, maybe just to mention finally, is just around the work we do with parents. So it's taking that family-based approach um, and making sure that they're involved in every stage that we're making the, the support available to young people. This report regularly having to battle with a system um, that is finding it difficult to manage their young person, and there are actually very simple things that could be done to support them. But how do you monitor access to careers advice by a young person who may be in and out of the system? Whose responsibility? You talked about face to face and one to one. Whose responsibility is to track? And, and, and the example of a child with autism is a good one, but there will be others that that child is having access or simple because in, in their absence nobody is tr sort of trace tracking that down to make sure they get that advice and support so um i guess in schools uh, what you'll find is a network uh, used to be classed as opportunities for all coordinators or, or groups and um, that maybe now be classed as dyw groups but whatever environment that that uh, whatever name they're giving themselves there is a very close-knit environment in schools um, that focuses on those young people who are not engaging with um, uh, either services or in school generally. SDS careers advisors are certainly part of that, with pastoral guidance staff, etc. Um, our careers advisors play a, quite a pivotal role in delivery of um, the Opportunities for All commitment for 16 to 19 year olds. So even beyond school, um, we retain those networks. So we use either local employability partnerships or um, uh, local authority groups in order to work with the different partners that are around. Um, using the data from the shared data set, um, where we know young people are either unconfirmed or unknown, um, and agree in a plan of action about how we find those young people, if we're being quite blunt about it. I mean, there is absolutely an ownership of that through the partnership for opportunities for all that do that, um, and in a school setting. And the different partners um, identifying who might be working with that young person, and can we do something differently? You know, I've, I, we've got many examples of careers advisors engaging with non-attenders outside of school at the agreement of that group because they feel that the relationship that they have, because it's impartial from a career information advice and guidance professional, um, is better to try and facilitate the return back into school and on many occasions where we've seen that as well. So there's a, there's a kind of group ownership around that. Um, and I guess in, in uh, post-school setting, if they're not in a school setting, um, certainly uh, as a lead partner in Opportunities for All, we are responsible for understanding I mean, where young people are. non attends a very generic group because we can not attend them for all sorts of reasons, including the fact that schools informally excluded them. But I wondered whether, and last question is, do you have specific training um, with people who engage with careers around specific conditions? So like, development mental needs of a young person with autism, would you have that specific training? Which you understand that child is not simply a non-attender, but even if you want to engage them, you'll need to engage in a particular yeah. way. The, the professional capacity of um, career information advice and guidance staff is to either provide that support or know who does provide that support. We've got a huge commitment to um, equalities um, at SDS. We have a network of uh, equality champions and advisors um, who uh, develop and uh, understand uh, what works in different areas. So it cuts right across the 1,600 people that um, are employed by SDS uh, across the whole of Scotland. Those equality groups are then um, bringing together what training they've attended, um, what partnership work has worked for them and to be able to support that, and identifying how we can provide some capacity building for our partners around the work that we do, and also how they do that as well. So there is absolute, there's a formal training programme in place, which takes additional support needs broadly. Um, and then um, locally, we use our partners to support 
um, practitioners in the development of their skills on an ongoing basis, because we too have a commitment to 21 hours um, CPD for our staff. Uh, Ms Mackay. Yeah. You know, yes, really just following on from, from that line of questioning, do, does your data tell you um, how many children who require the highest level of support, including care experienced children, um, how many of them are falling through the net, how many ha you, you don't catch? Don't, so just the, how many we don't catch specifically, well, is, how is many there data don't to access? Say that, that child should have received additional support, but they haven't. Yeah, so we've got quite a robust performance uh, monitoring framework um, in place at SDS, particularly focused around um, the delivery of CIAG services. So at each of those interventions in each year group and each cohort in a targeted um, group, um, we have an expectation around what support they're going to receive and we monitor that on a month by month basis. So advisors um, have access to that through our customer management system, so they know. Um, who is it that I've still to see? Who's not been there? Who's not been there for the last four weeks? Um, you know, a, a great examples of um, working with schools as well um, to share that information. So we began um, to provide that information not just to the teaching staff, but also formally to head teachers and directors of education so that there is a strategic buy-in. It goes back to the point Joan made earlier on about the awareness of the, all the services that exist in the school and in the local authority. Um, so we feel that sharing that information is actually going to improve access to the support if young people are not getting it. Um, and it allows us to be really honest about why they're not getting it. So if they are in school and they're not being let out of class, for example, um, is there a way that we can negotiate when we see them differently in order to be able to do that? So it becomes a planning tool for us in supporting young people. Do you put a figure on it to tell us today how many are not receiving support? Um, so it, it, the, the statistics that we put out says that we've engaged with 92% of um, uh, the population in broad general education. So there is 8% in there that has not have not accessed any services um, from S1 to S3. And that could be for a number of reasons. Um, it could be that they weren't in um, at all in school non-attenders. Um, it could be that they were absent during the period of time that we had planned to deliver those engagements and we do the best will in the world to follow that up with them um, and that may be through uh, maybe a one-to-one -one support rather than trying to manifest a group session with them so we do have a mechanism for being able to respond to that um, and it takes account of the conditions that are existing in schools when you've got eight to ten percent absence rates happening as well so it becomes quite a significant planning piece for you know sharing at a strategic level um, and also advisors with school staff Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, final question. Um, I, as close to a yes and no answer as you can have. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about the challenges and the scale of what's been asked in terms of culture change and all these kind of things. Um, and we're constantly hearing about the change in um, the demands of workforces, the fourth industrial revolution coming in, things like that. So um, I just want to ask a general question about the governance that's in place. Is, is it adequate to deliver what, what delivering the young workforce was supposed developing the young workforce was supposed to do, and also whether it's flexible enough to react to changes and, and respond to the learner journey review, for instance? Two, um, you mentioned their DYW and learner journey are absolutely in harness from there, and actually the. Um, the learner journey and day by day together we've actually formed the, the, the full articulation of curriculum for excellence up to 18 from that point of view but then to actually smooth, smooth those pathways um, routes and support into college university employment or, or whatever and to look after that that our young people up to the the, the age of 25 i think um, are um, essential now the the governance for learner journey is just beginning to start in there and education scotland will be more than actively involved in that i'm sure sds too um and we are making sure that internally it matches with our developing young workforce but the expectations coming from the program for learner journey are exactly the same in there so yes it's it's more than adequate i would say thank you mr russell do you want um, it, it's quite a pertinent point so the change theme leads um, across each of the dyw themes um, are already considering um, the progress that's been made and the learning um, that we've taken from the first half of that program and um, we understand that the there are ways that we could probably um increase the scale and pace of the activity with a different governance structure. So that's something that we are considering um, with Scottish Government and the other um, change team leads about how do we build on what we know now works and how do we be much more targeted um, in our activity and in our interventions and in our support. Um, and I think just to reiterate the point that Alan's made, um, 
the emergence of the learner journey recommendations. Um, a great word that Alan uses is that it provides some impetus to the work that we're doing um, in DYW, but it also provides a very specific focus in areas which requires a different level of um, action, um, and, and that's very clear for us to, to respond to. Okay, thank you very much. Can I thank both Skills Development Scotland and Education Scotland for their attendance this morning and their contribution. I'm going to suspend just for a, a few moments to let the panel um, uh, leave the room. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item two. Thank you. Um, we are considering the responses that the committee has received to report an inquiry into poverty and attainment and achievement of school-aged children. We have received responses from the Scottish Government, COSLA, and from Education Scotland. And there are some responses specific to the committee recommendations that include the Government highlighting its work towards a new measurement of deprivation based on social background um, and I invite members views and responses as to how, how they want to take this forward. I thought it was very encouraging actually to hear um, that there will be a review of that because I think the evidence that we're getting from various quarters is that it's not really uh, satisfactory just now, so I was, I was encouraged by that. Okay. Are, are we content to note the responses and with a view to maybe coming back to this when there's further information further down the line? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now move on to agenda item three, which um, brings us into private session.